Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein, and this lecture is going to be on heart failure, and this is going to cover the content that you need for the Advanced Pharmacology course, which is part of the foundational core courses for nurse practitioner education. So first, we're going to go ahead and we'll start talking about the foundations of heart failure care, and let's begin with talking the stages and classes. So heart failure is divided, divided into four stages and four classes. The stages are based on physiological anatomical findings versus the classes are based on symptoms. So stage A is patient at risk. They have comorbidities, things like that. Stage B is where we start to find structural issues with the patient. Stage C is where they become symptomatic. Stage D is where they have advanced uh, symptoms. More often, you're going to deal in pharmacology. You're going to be dealing with the NYHA, the New York Heart Association classification, class one through four. Class one is where a patient doesn't really have any symptoms. Sometimes they might have it, depending what exact guideline you look at when they're doing severe exercise, but generally speaking, class one has no symptoms. Class two is where they begin to have symptoms with mild to moderate activity. Class three is where Basic activity, such as going to check the mail, is already going to cause them to have symptoms. And finally, class four is where they have symptoms even when they're at rest. So let's talk a little bit about the diagnosis of heart failure, and then we're going to jump into the pharmacology. Heart failure, obviously, this is a very significant diagnosis. I believe it has something like a, roughly a 50% um, five-year mortality rate, and that's been improving but uh, with, the event, or with the distribution of LVADs and obviously heart transplants, so that those numbers are improving, but that's still a really significant mortality. So you're going to do a full massive workup, obviously it's going to cardiology and all of that. I wanted to mention two specific diagnostic tools that you're going to see a little bit later on in pharmacology. One is a BNP, which stands for B-type natriuretic peptide or brain-type natriuretic peptide. And there's also another variation of that. Uh, pro uh, BNP. And what these are, this is a test that we can use to determine if a patient's in heart failure. And this is going to come up a little bit when we start to talk about Entresto, which is one of the drugs that's used for heart failure. BNP, beta or B type natriuretic peptide, is released by the heart when the heart is failing. When the heart is having to overstretch in order to deliver, to increase its own output the heart will release BNP. And what the BNP is going to do, it's going to cause vasodilation of the aorta. And by causing that vasodilation, that's going to reduce the afterload. Let's make sure we really understand those concepts. When a patient's heart is failing, they, uh, the pump is having a hard time pumping out the blood that it's supposed to. That's its job. Now, if the pump has to pump its blood into a really tight aorta, it has to really push that blood into a tight aorta, that's really difficult. As opposed to if there's a nice wide open aorta, it's so much easier to get the blood up into there. So when the heart is failing, it releases BNP, which vasodilates the aorta, which reduces afterload. That's just the medical terminology, but what's that doing? It's opening up the aorta so that the heart can push its blood into a wide open tube, which is so much easier than having to squeeze it into a really tight aorta. A TTE or a transthoracic echocardiogram is an ultrasound that we use to look structurally at the heart. That's where we look at the valves. That's where we look at the wall. That's where we look at the motion, the blood flow, all of it. A TTE, a very, very important fundamental tool that we use in the diagnosis of heart failure. And the most foundational point where we use it is in distinguishing between HEF-REF and HEF-PEF. And what that is, is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. That's what's on the screen, H-F-R-E-F, -E heart failure with reduced ejection fraction versus HEF-PEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So a normal ejection fraction is somewhere around 55 to 70 to 75, something in that range, depending on which book or guideline you look at. And what does that mean? Every time blood flows into the left ventricle, the left ventricle, picture it like a bag valve mask, like we use in CPR. 
When you squeeze that band valve mask at CPR, you're not squeezing the daylights out of the bag. You're not trying to empty every drop of air out of the bag. You're just trying to squeeze enough to get the chest to rise. Well, same thing with the heart. The blood that comes into the heart from the um, left atria, from the lungs, from the right side of the heart, the left ventricle is going to squeeze that blood into the aorta and out through the whole body. But it's not going to squeeze every last drop of blood out of the heart. Now, the more healthy a heart is, the more it will squeeze out. The less healthy a heart is, the less it will squeeze out. So an ejection fraction is a fraction. It's a percentage of how much of the blood that's in the heart gets ejected with each contraction, with each squeeze of the heart. The more that gets ejected, the healthier the heart. The less that gets ejected, the less healthy the heart. So a heart that has an EF, an ejection fraction of 55 and up, is a healthy heart. Um, for the purposes of diagnosing heart failure, 50 uh, and above with signs and symptoms or other structural identifications of heart failure is going to get you a diagnosis of heart failure with preserved EF versus an EF of under 40, where less than 40% of all the blood that flows into the left ventricle at the start of contraction, less than 40% of that is actually squeezed out. That's a heart that's in pretty bad shape. And that patient has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And those are two key concepts that you have to understand because that's going to come up when we discuss the medications and what medications we use for what. One last thing I want to point out is a general understanding of heart failure in that when a heart is really good, when it has a good ejection fraction, that's a really strong heart. To give you an example, if I'm carrying 50 boxes up into a new apartment, up three flights of stairs, if I'm really strong, I can do that in just, let's say, I take three boxes Per, per time that I go up the stairs. So I'm only gonna need to do, what's that? 17, 18 trips up the stairs. Versus if I'm really out of shape, I'm gonna need to do 50 trips, one box at a time to get all 50 boxes up. Same thing here, a really good healthy heart can pump much more efficiently, can pump more blood. So it doesn't need as many pumps per minute. This should now be clicking with you that a really healthy heart has a low heart rate because it doesn't need to make 50 trips up the, up the stairs. It doesn't need to be 80, 90, 100 times per minute. It's really good. It can get the same job done in just 50 beats or 60 beats per minute. That's a really healthy heart. So let's move on and talk about the management. Obviously we begin with lifestyle modifications. If you've seen some other cardiac videos on this channel, you know that most of this stuff is the same thing. It's gonna be diet, it's gonna be exercise, manage their blood pressure, manage their diabetes, and obviously help them quit smoking. Um, some of this can get referral, refer them to endo if they have diabetes, refer them um, to cardiac for a full stress test workup and all of that, and obviously make sure that all of their comorbidities are being managed. Now let's start to talk about actual pharmacological management of a patient with heart failure. The current recommendations and all the guidelines you're going to see in this video come from the American Heart Association's most recent guidelines, AHA, ACC published in regards to the, man to the management of heart failure. So we recommend a triple combination therapy that's gonna include something to block the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It's gonna include a beta blocker and it's gonna include a diuretic. So let's go through each of those. RAS, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We talk about this more extensively in the hypertension lecture. If you've watched that, we get more into it in there. But for now, let's just give the brief overview. This is a class of one of three different drugs that are going to block the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This system causes a higher blood pressure by increasing the amount of volume we hold on to um, through the release of aldosterone and by vasoconstricting through the release of angiotensin II. So and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system causes our blood pressure to go up through two ways, by holding on to fluid which it causes by releasing aldosterone and through vasoconstricting, which it is resulted from angiotensin II. So that's one class of drugs we're going to use. Another class are beta blockers. This is a massively broad class. Again, this was covered in the hypertension lecture. If you haven't already seen it, go ahead and watch that to get a really deep understanding of beta blockers. But really basic, this is going to slow down the heart. Now, you got to be crystal clear in understanding this. A beta blocker for heart failure is absolutely not the same dose that we're using in a beta blocker in hypertension. Why? 
Well, think about it. The heart is already failing. If it's not good at its job, they have heart failure. It's not good at its job. Slowing down the heart is not the right answer. But we do use beta blockers. Why? For two reasons. First of all, you have to understand this pathophysiologic concept of heart failure. There's really two problems. One is the heart is not pumping enough blood to meet all the demands of the body. But the second problem and more immediate is that the heart itself is not getting enough perfusion. And because it's not getting enough perfusion, that's why that patient gets short of breath. That's why they develop chest pain when they're exerting because of that coronary ischemia. So in regards to these two problems, one is we need to obviously ensure that the body is getting adequate perfusion, but really we need to do this by getting the heart better. So most of our treatment is gonna focus on helping the heart pump and it's gonna focus on helping the heart get better. So beta blockers are gonna focus on getting the, helping the heart get better. So I didn't, I didn't go through this, let me back up a second. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is going to be treated with either an ACE and ARBA and ARNI, and we'll discuss those in a second, but each of those drugs, remember we said renin angiotensin aldosterone system is going to cause hypertension. It's going to vasoconstrict and hold on to fluid. By blocking that system, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to help get rid of some fluid. That should make easy sense to you. If the heart is failing, if it can't pump all of this blood, if I get rid of some of that volume, then there's less work on the heart. So that makes sense. Second problem, is, or the second way that this helps, is this is going to block that vasoconstriction. Remember we said RAS, retin angiotensin aldosterone system, is gonna cause vasoconstriction, and I'm giving you a RAS blocker, like an ACE or an ARB or something, and by blocking that, I'm actually gonna cause vasodilation. So if I vasodilate those coronary, the aorta, then I'm making it easier for the heart to pump out that blood. So I'm actually helping the heart in two ways with a RAS blocker both by making it less volume that the heart needs to deal with because it's already failing with its current workload. We don't want to give it more work. We want to give it less work. And secondly, by making it easier on the heart to pump that blood into the aorta. That's how a RAS blocker and ACE and ARB and ARNI helps. Next, we just mentioned beta blockers. So how does the beta blocker help? Well, it helps in two ways. One is it slows down the heart rate just a smidge. We're not giving a full hypertension dose. We're giving a much smaller dose with much less effects. And usually when we're giving a beta blocker for the treatment of heart failure, we're not using propanolol or one of those. We're almost always gonna use carbetalol, which is Coreg. That's gonna be our go-to beta blocker for heart failure. Now it's going to be given at a dose that's gonna lower the heart rate just a little bit. That's gonna accomplish two things. First of all, picture doing push-ups. If I'm doing 80 push-ups, I need enough oxygen to do 80 push-ups. That's a good demand on my body. If I lower that to, let's say, 76 push-ups, that's a little bit less oxygen demand. Obviously, in this case, the heart's already failing. The heart's not getting all the perfusion it needs. So by lowering the heart rate a little bit, I'm lowering the oxygen demand a little bit, and hopefully that's helpful. The second way the beta blocker helps is by lowering that heart rate a little bit, I get the chance to fill for the heart to fill up a little bit more between every contraction. Picture a Ferris wheel. For example, I live in Vegas, so we have the really big Ferris wheel here and it keeps moving continuously and people keep boarding as it's moving. If I speed it up, not as many people could get on board. And even though it's doing more rotations, it's not very efficient because not as many people were able to get on board. Same thing with the heart. By lowering the heart rate, it's not gonna pump as many times, but guess what? Each pump is gonna be a little bit more effective because a little bit more blood was allowed to flow into the heart between contractions. So those are the ways that beta blockers can help. Don't forget beta blockers have a black box warning that they should not be abruptly stopped. And that makes perfect sense. If the heart has an easier time working when a beta blocker is on board, if I suddenly stop taking a beta blocker, I would have adverse cardiac events. So that's the second uh, way we're gonna help this patient pharmacologically. The third way is with a diuretic. By getting rid of some fluid, the heart is struggling to, to pump all the volume that it has. It's starting to possibly build up in the lungs, possibly starting to build up in the periphery. So by taking some of that volume off, it's less volume that the heart needs to deal with. Hopefully by there being less volume there, the heart will be able to handle this reduced workload and now it will be okay. 
Keep in mind, you are obviously not starting all of these at once. You would start them one at a time, usually in the order that I have it listed, the RAS blocker, the beta blocker, and then the diuretic. For a diuretic, you may see some guidelines. Instead of saying diuretic, they say mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, which is another drug class for spironolactone. Spironolactone is a diuretic, but it's also considered in the drug class MRA, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. Same thing if you see it in different places. Remember with all of these drugs, you have to put in your orders, you have to put in parameters to go ahead and uh, start these drugs one at a time. Don't crash the patient with all of them. Let them be on it for a week or two uh, or longer if needed, especially if they're really un um, unhealthy and then get them slowly up to having all of these drugs on board. Also keep in mind, you're gonna have to put parameters in there to in the hospital setting to withhold it for a low blood pressure or in the case of a beta blocker, low blood pressure or a low heart rate. So let's go ahead and look at what these drugs are. The beta blockers we already talked about, I'm not gonna spend time on that again. ACEs and ARBs we already talked about again, all of that was in the hypertension lecture. So I'm gonna move on to the drugs that we haven't seen yet. The first one is gonna be an ARNI, A-R-N-I. And that is stands for um, angiotensin receptor neoplylosin inhibitor. So an ARNI, what these drugs do is the it's two parts. It's sacubitril and valsartan. There's only one FDA approved today in the United States that I'm aware of. We're filming this in uh, towards the end of 2023. And the brand name is Entresto. Entresto in many guidelines is our first line agent, especially for symptomatic heart failure. So what is it? One part of it is valsartan. Well, that's an R. We already talked about that. That blocks the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. That blocks the vasoconstriction, giving us vasodilation, helping the heart pump its blood into the aorta a little bit easier. Plus it does a little bit of blocking aldosterone. So it blocks holding onto fluid, helping it get rid of fluid. Again, making the job of the heart easier. First of all, keep in mind, know everything about an ARB because any ARB question is fair game when it comes to asking about Entresto secubitril valsartan because it literally has an ARB in it. So let me spend a second and talk about what secubitril is. Well, secubitril is actually um, something that, that protects um, BNP. We talked about BNP earlier, beta type natriuretic peptide. We said the heart releases it and it causes vasodilation. Well, secubitril blocks the body from getting rid of BNP. By blocking the body from getting rid of BNP, it's a neoprilocin inhibitor. NI is neoprilocin inhibitor. It inhibits neoprilocin and neoprilocin gets rid of that natriuretic peptide, that BNP. That BNP, remember from the beginning, is helpful. It dilates the blood vessels, making the job, the heart, job of the heart easier. And this will go ahead and allow the heart an easier time to pump blood by blocking the body from getting rid of BNP because BNP is actually helpful. Um, when a patient is diagnosed with heart failure, if they're already previously on an ACE or an ARB, like many millions of Americans are, but now they're diagnosed with heart failure and you wanna switch them to Entresto, make sure you allow 36 hours between doses from when they last took an ACE or an ARB before they go ahead and switch it over to here. One more thing I wanna keep in mind, is that, um, actually we'll talk about this in just a little bit uh, when we get to vasodilators about how we're talking now about how reducing the afterload, the, the constriction in the aorta, we're talking about how that helps. But when we get to vasodilators, I'm also gonna talk about how reducing the preload helps as well. The next drug that we have here on our primary medication list, remember we had the RAS antagonist, so we already learned ACEs and ARBs, and now I just covered the ARNI. We already learned beta blockers in the past, and now I'm gonna cover the diuretic. So the full electron diuretics will be part of nephrology, but let's focus on just this one drug because this is probably the most common diuretic that we use in patients with heart failure. So sprinolactone, you may see this considered a diuretic. You may see this considered an MRA, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. You may see this called an aldosterone antagonist, and you may see this called a potassium sparing diuretic. All of these would be referring to sprinolactone. So this drug is a new drug that we haven't discussed yet. It's indicated for ascites. It's indicated, and this is going to be ascites edema that's related to liver failure. And it's also going to be used for heart failure with reduced EF, as well as for hypertension. Now, it does have some other uses. It's also used off-label to help acne and hair loss in women. It's used to help hirsutism. 
and it's used off-label for HEF-PEF, where they still have preserved EF, and it's also used off-label for transgender females that's male, uh, born biologically males. So all of these are the different indications for spironolactone. Obviously, today we're talking about reduced EF. This drug is a aldosterone antagonist. If you remember from what we discussed, the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system, aldosterone is a hormone. And what it does is it gets the body to hold on to sodium and chloride. And by holding on to sodium and chloride, the body holds on to fluid. So it makes us hold on to fluid. Obviously, we don't want that. In the case of heart failure, we want less fluid. So we're going to go ahead and give an aldosterone blocker, an aldosterone antagonist, to help the body get rid of some of this fluid. This uh, medication is going to work by blocking aldosterone, but it does have um, a whole number of different things that it can mess with. So in a patient that is put on this, you have to monitor their sodium, their potassium, their uric acid, glucose, the whole list that I have on the screen are all uh, monitoring considerations that you're going to have when putting a patient on this. The most important out of all of these by far is the potassium that you need to watch. Also consider if the patient's on any other drugs, such as an ACE or an ARB, that can cause some hyperkalemia. This can definitely cause hyperkalemia. And the two together, you got to pay attention and watch out. Yes, they are recommended to be together. Yes, I did just say that together they can cause hyperkalemia. Just keep an eye on it, closely monitor it, um, especially when you're first starting off treatment to make sure there's no issues there. Another um, issue that can occur is gynecomastia, which is um, breast development in males. So when we're giving it to a male patient, we're going to monitor for that as well. Spironolactone is gen not generally recommended in pregnancy. We do have safer diuretics for the use in pregnancy. So that covers all the primary medications, those triple combination of a uh, beta blocker, of an, a RAS antagonist, and a diuretic that we're going to give. That's the primary foundations of symptomatic heart failure treatment. Now let's move on to a few more things that are in the guidelines. The SGLT2 inhibitors, and I apologize, I just noticed that's wrong on the top of the slide. The second part, of, second time it says it is correct. SGLT2 inhibitors. So these medications are actually used for um, diabetes, and recently they got approved for heart failure as well. I say recently, it's not that recent. The first one of these that got approved for heart failure was over five years ago. But these medications have now actually made their way into the official AHA ACC guidelines and up to date uses this straight in their recommendation right along with the other three medications that we already mentioned. So what are these medications? Well, SGLT2 is responsible for having the, the kidneys hold on to the vast majority of the glucose that makes its way through the nephron. 90% of all the glucose that makes its way through the nephron is retained in the body by SGLT2. By inhibiting, by blocking SGLT2, we're able to disrupt the body holding on to all that glucose. And we're actually able to allow, um, I believe it's up to 50% of all the glucose that this that would normally be uh, held on. Now the body is not gonna hold on to it. The body is instead gonna pee it out. So we're gonna reduce our overall glucose level. The really short answer is it increases urinary glucose excretion, thereby lowering your serum blood glucose level. I just gave you the APRN, a little bit longer version as well. What drugs are we talking about? The generic names are pretty hard to say. I'm going to play it safe and stick to the uh, brand names that I'm sure we've all seen in commercials, Farsiga, Jardians, Invokana. These are the three, and I believe there's a fourth today that's actually on the market as well, but these are the three primary SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and I believe all three of them now are approved for heart failure. Um, if not all three, then for sure two out of three are approved for heart failure. Um, these are also used off-label for chronic kidney disease. We're not going to discuss that today. The adverse effects of this drug class, and of course, we're going to visit this drug class again when we get to the treatment of diabetes, when we're discussing endocrine. Um, the adverse effects, acute kidney injury, fractures, hypovolemia, GU infections, by far most common a UTI, and it can also cause DKA. Um, this medication does have an increased risk of resulting in lower limb amputation, so you're going to want to make sure you have a good assessment on your patient before you go ahead and start that. Right now, it's not recommended in pregnancy. It doesn't specifically say that it's contraindicated, but it does say that um, it's not recommended in pregnancy. So this medication, even though, and before you get confused, this is 100% a diabetes medication, that's what it's labeled for. It is actually also labeled as officially used for heart failure. And like I said, it's right there in the AHA guidelines and UpToDate considers it right up there with the other three medications in terms of recommendation for 
pharmacological treatment of symptomatic heart failure. Uh, we know that this is a diabetes medication, but it has been clinically shown to reduce mortality in heart failure patients. Next, we have cardiac glycosides. And the drug that we're talking about here is digoxin. If you hear digitalis, digitalis is the ingredient that digoxin is um, produced from. So how does digoxin work? Well, digoxin actually has two mechanisms of action because it's used for two different things. It's used for heart failure, specifically HEF-REF, heart failure with reduced EF, and it's used for dysrhythmias. When it's used for dysrhythmias, its mechanism of action is that it slows conduction through the AV node. We know that dysrhythmias, we haven't covered it yet, but you know this already from the RN level, dysrhythmias is where the patient's heart is uh, beating abnormally because of an abnormal electrical conduction through the heart. Well, the AV node is meant to slow things down to prevent um, abnormal rhythms. Please know, I'm not sure how familiar you are with ECGs, but this drug works by slowing conduction through the AV node. The only way this drug works is if it, the abnormal impulse is coming from above the AV node, meaning a supraventricular rhythm, not a ventricular rhythm. It has to be a supra, superior to a supra ventricular rhythm, such as AFib or A-flutter. And AFib and A-flutter are by far the two most common dysrhythmias that digoxin is used for. Like I started saying, the other thing that digoxin is used for is heart failure with reduced EF. And in that case, its mechanism of action is that it has a, a positive inotropic effect. Hopefully you remember what that means from basic nursing school. It's where the heart beats harder and stronger. Now, what causes that? The end result of how that's caused is by the, the digoxin causing an a increased force in the rush of calcium into the cells. We know that when the cell contracts, the primary, the, the component of that, that that has the biggest impact on how forceful the movement is, whether it's any muscle movement, but today we're talking about the heart, we know that calcium is most important in that. And by manipulating the sodium, it is able to have an effect on the calcium. I know I said sodium there, don't get confused. By manipulating the sodium, it has an effect on the calcium and it makes the calcium rush in uh, across the membranes much more powerfully, thereby resulting in a more powerful contraction of the heart, thereby having that positive inotropic effect. Another term for that is increased contractility where the heart beats stronger. Now, as you can imagine, in a patient with heart failure where the heart is not doing a good job, remember that ejection fraction is pretty poor. They're not getting a lot of that blood out that's in there. They're just sort of um, half blanking it. They're not really squeezing hard. This gives it a kick in the pants. It gets the heart to really squeeze harder to get that uh, increased uh, cardiac output, which is hopefully going to help the patient with heart failure. So those are the two mechanisms of actions that it has, and that correlates directly to the two different indications that we use digoxin for. Digoxin can be started with a slow or rapid strategy. Um, this You probably didn't learn this much at the RN level. However, really quick here, Slow is where we're giving it orally. We usually start them off on a low dose, let's say for seven to 14 days, and then we slowly increase their dose up until we get the positive effects that we want to treat their heart failure. A rapid strategy, most of the time is where we're uh, initiating it IV. This is always obviously in the hospital setting. And this is mostly where we're doing it to treat a dysrhythmia. And like I said, the two most common dysrhythmias by far that the joxin is used for is AFib and A-flutter. This medication does have a large number of adverse effects, which is why its usage has gone down and down and down over the last many years as we've come up with more drugs and probably better drugs for the treatment of heart failure and dysrhythmias, but this is still in the guidelines. So again, slow is where we're usually doing it orally, you usually start off slow and increase it over um, a week or two before we bump it up again. Rapid is where we do it IV, do it in the hospital, and that's where we're doing it for dysrhythmias. Usually in that case, we would do a loading dose and then a maintenance dose, et cetera, until we get them to a therapeutic level. The adverse effects, nausea and vomiting, visual disturbances. This drug is very famous and made its way into a ton of test banks about it causing halos around lights. So definitely uh, put that one somewhere in your brain. And then bradycardia. Obviously, we said it slows conduction through the AV node, so that can cause bradycardia. And I know it's ironic because it's used to treat dysrhythmias, but it can also cause dysrhythmias. Finally, this drug has a narrow therapeutic range which means that um, you're gonna to need to closely monitor and follow this patient, especially when you're starting them, them on it, and especially when you're changing their dosages. And finally, this drug does have a reversal agent because the joxin toxicity can definitely be something that you see in practice. And especially if you work in cardiology, 
It does have a reversal agent. The reversal agent is the joxin immune fab, which is actually a monoclonal antibody, if that rings a bell as a uh, drug class or drug type. And we'll talk more about that in future lectures. But that is definitely um, something to know that this is uh, can be reversed if you do see a question about an overdose of cardiac glycoside or of digoxin or too much effects of digitalis, the digoxin immune fab is what we have available. And finally, we have our vasodilators. Vasodilators, we talk about this in a few different sections throughout advanced pharmacology. However, right now we're going to focus on just this one. The brand name is Vidil, and the generic name is hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate. So this is actually a combination drug of two medications in it. When we use it for heart failure, we don't use either one by itself. We use the two together. Hydralazine is also discussed in the hypertension lecture because that is used sometimes for um, hypertension, especially in pregnancy. However, now we're talking about heart failure. So we're going to talk about the two together, hydralazine with isosorbide dinitrate. Hydralazine causes arterial dilation. Isosorbide dinitrate causes vasodilation. So what do we get out of that? Well, from the hydralazine, we get a arterial dilation. Remember, we said that's going to reduce afterload, and that's going to increase the heart's ability to push blood out into the aorta, making the heart's job a little easier. On the other side, with isosorbide dinitrate, we're going to get some va uh, venous vasodilation. If I get venous vasodilation, then I have more space, more capacity in my venous system. Therefore, I don't have as much blood returning to the heart. So I'm going to be reducing preload. I'm going to be reducing preload by giving you a, a drug that causes this, this type of venous dilation. By reducing the preload, I'm going to reduce the workload of the heart because if the heart has a whole ton of blood coming at it that it has to pump out, that's going to increase the workload of the heart versus if I decrease preload by expanding the, the capacity of the venous system by vasodilating the venous system, I am able to reduce the workload of the heart. Again, that's one of the two important things we said we need with heart failure. A, we needed the heart to pump better and B, we needed to go ahead and be able to um, to, to help itself and help itself heal. What is this drug used for? It's used for heart failure with reduced EF. It reduces preload and it reduces afterload. We just talked about that. This is not a first line agent. Um, it does have a number of side effects, hypotension, orthostatic hypertension, reflex tachycardia, all that basic stuff that you already learned in your RN um, pharmacology course. One thing to know about this, and not only this, but all vasodilators, you probably remember a bunch of this. Remember nitro is also in this class, the drug that um, almost always gives patients a headache. You have to have a monitor or check the blood pressure before you order it. It has to have parameter, like to withhold it below a systolic of 90, all of that stuff that you remember from RN education. Also note that vasodilators can build up a tolerance. And so therefore, if a patient is on this drug, you do need to continually have a follow-up plan in place to make sure that your patient is still getting the effects that they um, need out of this medication. There are other drugs that we use for acute decompensated heart failure. That's going to be our vasopressors like dobutamine or epinephrine. Those are not going to be discussed in this lecture. Those are going, going to be in a separate lecture where we discuss the drugs for shock, where we discuss the vasopressors. Here I included our references. If you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe to our channel, and I hope you enjoyed watching.